In this video, I'm going to explain the photoelectric effect, which of course was the reason that Albert Einstein won a Nobel Prize in 1921, along with his services to theoretical physics. So what is the photoelectric effect? Well, it's the following simple phenomenon that if you have light coming in to some material, then electrons can be emitted. And it's a very interesting phenomenon for the following reasons, that it doesn't really fit at all with what classical physics would have expected. So on this commemorative stamp, uh, which was from 1979, in other words, 100 years after Albert Einstein was born, um, what we see then here in this stamp is that we've got various colours of light coming in, incident on this surface, and you can see that we're getting electrons liberated from the surface. So that's the photoelectric effect, but look at the characteristics of what is going on. You can see here that for low frequencies of light, such as the red or orange light here, we get this small velocity vector of the emitted electrons, whereas for higher frequencies of light, the blue end here up to ultraviolet, we get these much larger velocity vectors. So we're observing that the frequency of the light is related to the velocity of the emitted electrons, in other words, their kinetic energy. And in particular, then, we also notice that if the light has too low a frequency, such as being too far to the red end or infrared end of the spectrum, then no electrons are emitted at all. And so we see this interesting concept of the so-called threshold frequency, whereby the light needs to be at least of that certain frequency in order to give rise to the photoelectric effect. If uh, the light is below that, there is no emission of electrons. And it's also observed that different materials have different threshold frequencies. So according to the metal or whatever that is used, that uh, frequency requirement will differ. Now, this was a mystery for standard classical physics, which would expect that um, if you put in, for example, red light, if you keep going for enough time, eventually an electron should be emitted. But in fact, that doesn't happen at all. Whereas in contrast, if you were to put in some ultraviolet, just at very low intensity, you would rapidly get emission of electrons. So why is that? So let's just clarify then the photoelectric effect had this uh, rather curious result that emission of any electrons depended on the frequency of the light. You know, why would it depend on the colour of the light? Very unusual. It also then, in terms of the quantity of electrons, that only depended on the intensity of the light. So if you had very intense ultraviolet light, then you get a lot of photoelectrons. But if you lowered the intensity of the ultraviolet, uh, you'd still get electrons, but not as many of them. In contrast, if you put red light in, you could put a lot, you know, very intense red light, nothing would happen, no electrons at all. Okay, so this did not fit with classical physics at all because that would expect that you know, light waves uh, would just be transferring energy slowly but surely. If you wait for long enough, you should get electrons emitted. And that was not at all the case with the photoelectric effect. So what Albert Einstein did was to pick up the following equation, which Max Planck had put forward some time earlier when he was investigating light bulbs and trying to explain electromagnetic radiation coming off from black bodies, from light bulbs, and so on. He had put this mathematical fudge uh, for his formula in place, and Einstein picked that up and actually showed that this perfectly explains the photoelectric effect, which is the following, which is to say that light can be regarded as packets or quanta of energy which are called photons. So instead of thinking about light as a wave, if we consider light now as photons and each of those photons has a particular energy given by this very simple formula, then this actually beautifully explains the photoelectric effect. In other words, the energy of a photon, a quantum of light, is simply proportional to the frequency of the light. And the constant of proportionality there is Planck's constant h. So let's see how this works. Okay, let's quickly go back and just clarify then that this phenomenon is explained by using these packets of energy, whereby if the frequency of the light is greater, then the energy of the light is greater, 
and it gives off photoelectrons with greater energy. But let's look into um, the experimental detail more closely now. So here I've got uh, a surface, an emitter, where I'm shining red light onto it, and you'll observe no electrons are being emitted, just like I've said earlier. But if I increase the frequency of the light, in other words, if I go from the red end to the bluer end of the spectrum, then suddenly when I go above the threshold frequency for that particular uh, material, then electrons, photoelectrons, are emitted and detected by the collector here. So these are two electrodes. This is effectively a, a glass, a piece of glass with a vacuum, hardly any air in there, so the electrons can easily make it across the gap. And then if we were to put a, a current meter here, we could measure flow of current, in other words, photoelectrons being emitted as a result of that incident light. As mentioned before then, depending on the material here, um, there'll be a different necessary threshold frequency before the photoelectric effect occurs. And of course, each material then has what's called a different work function. In other words, that's like the, the uh, binding energy of those electrons, if you like. If the photons don't have enough energy, then they will not be able to liberate um, an electron from the surface. So what we can say then is that the maximum kinetic energy of one of these emitted electrons is equal to then the quantum of a photon, or the energy quantum, um, the energy of a particular photon, which is HF, minus um, the work function that needs to have been overcome to escape from that material. So HF is the energy of a photon minus the work function of the material gives us the maximum possible kinetic energy um, related to a velocity directly um, in that direction from the emitter towards the collector. Right, let's look in a bit more detail then as to what we can do to investigate the photoelectric effect and in fact even lead us to being able to measure remarkably Planck's constant is that we can apply a potential difference across this system. And that's what I'm showing here by adding on this circuit here. I can do an applied voltage to either help or resist that current flow, even to the point of stopping the photoelectric effect, which will give us a lot of insight into the material and into being able to measure Planck's constant. So conventionally then, current flow would be in this direction because it's the flow of direction of a positive charge, uh, whereas electrons are negatively charged, so they're going round in the other direction. Okay, so let's uh, take this diagram and uh, change its form a little bit. So I've got light coming in here and electrons being emitted, giving rise to a current flow and of course current flows um, in the direction conventionally of a positive charge, so the current flow would be from top to bottom in that figure. What I can do then is first of all say, well, if there's no light, then what I can do here is show the total current here as zero current, and at the moment, I'm not applying any voltage between those two terminals, and so there's no light, no current, and no voltage, so very simple starting point. Then, if I start to introduce light, if I put red light in, as mentioned, if it's not above that threshold frequency for the material that's making up the emitter, no current, no photoelectric effect is occurring. If I increase the frequency of the light, now I do get a non-zero current. I actually get current flow here, and that's what I'm showing by that red circle, basically giving us a, a non-zero current, even though I've applied no voltage, of course. This is a current due to the photoelectric effect. Okay, so I'm going to represent that as a blue dashed box to indicate the basic photoelectric effect. Then what I'm going to do is now apply a positive um, potential here across uh, these two electrodes to encourage the flow of electrons. Now, of course, it's not going to increase the number of electrons emitted from here. What it will just do is um, just make sure that the ones that are emitted from the surface, they'll be emitted in various directions with the positive um, applied voltage here, it will encourage those electrons to make it directly to the collector. And so as we increase the voltage, more and more of those escaping photoelectrons are, if you like, focused towards arriving at the collector until the point of the so-called saturation current where effectively we've put, applied quite a high voltage and therefore encouraged each and every escaped electron to cross that gap. 
Now, where it gets interesting is if we do a reverse potential. So this is the red box here shown here, which means if I apply a negative potential here, what I can do is resist the flow of current and actually stop all the current flowing. So as I begin to do a negative potential, I'm reducing the current flow. The most energetic photoelectrons will still make it for a limited negative voltage here, but there'll come a certain, certain voltage here the cut off the stopping potential, whereby none of those photoelectrons will ever make it across the gap. So that's the so-called stopping potential, as mentioned here, um, that will cease all of current flow in the system. And um, therefore, the more energetic those, photo those electrons are, the higher, uh, or rather the greater that uh, V0 needs to be. In other words, the more negative, the, the magnitude of it needs to increase according to the energy given to those emitted photoelectrons. And this then is what we're going to use in our equations next to really understand the photoelectric effect even more. Before doing that though, just to make a few more observations, this is similar to that figure I've just shown, just to reveal that if I doubled the intensity of the light, then sure I can double the current flow, but notice crucially that the stopping potential is the same. In other words, it doesn't matter if I how much I increase um, the intensity of the light, I can still just stop all those photoelectrons just by exactly the same level of the stopping potential, okay? So in other words, in the intensity of the light relates to the quantity, not the energy, of the uh, emitted electrons. Now, let's consider what happens if I change the frequency of the light. Now, this is really revealing that that E equals HF is indeed the case. In other words, if I now go to a, an increased frequency of light, then what happens there is I now need a greater stopping potential. Okay, all I did was change the color of the light and suddenly I have to really ramp up that voltage to be able to stop the, the current flow, even though here, exactly the same voltage would have stopped whatever intensity of light for that particular frequency. Whereas if I uh, increase the frequency, even though it's the same intensity of light, I've now got to use a much higher stopping potential, therefore revealing again uh, the link between frequency of the light and energy of the light. So E equals HF, really at the heart of these results shown here. Right, this is another way of looking at what we've just considered. We've got light coming in. This is the emitter. We know the energy is equal to HF. That's the key equation from Planck adopted by Einstein for the photoelectric effect. So it's just written as uh, HC over lambda. And then as we know, we've got a collector here. The electrons are being emitted and uh, we can measure current flow, okay, when uh, this light is of sufficient frequency. Okay, because the light, um, the energy deposited needs to overcome the work function of that surface, that emitter. Okay, and the uh, kinetic energy of the electrons is half mv squared, very standard equation. And we're going to say, therefore, that the kinetic energy of the emitted electrons is equal to the energy of a given photon minus the work function of the material. Now, if we apply a potential there, we're going to really focus those electrons towards arriving at the collector as we increase the, the potential difference there. And so we can actually say um, that also, just remember what I showed earlier, we could also reverse that potential. And if we reverse that potential, so when we applied it before, we encouraged the current flow, but now by reversing the direction of the potential, we can actually stop all current flow and therefore say that the uh, potential energy, this is E, the charge of an electron, times that stopping potential, that needs to have matched the most energetic electrons that have escaped. So K max, the maximum kinetic energy, if we've stopped all of the current flow, we have need to have achieved this potential energy EV0. So V0 needs to be large enough to match that uh, maximum kinetic energy. And of course, we know from before that the kinetic energy max is the energy from a photon minus the work function. Okay, so this is the final slide I want to show, just indicating the kinds of things that we can do then with the photoelectric effect. So imagine we've got some particular material, such as zinc here, 
what we can do is shine light of various frequencies on this material and measure what is the stopping potential, the stopping voltage needed in order to stop uh, the current flow. And you can see that um, the stopping voltage needs to go up directly, linearly in proportion to the frequency of the light. And then there is some threshold frequency below which no stopping potential is needed at all uh, because the photoelectric effect hasn't occurred. In other words, we've not uh, delivered enough energy to the system to overcome the work function. And uh, so you could do this, and um, with this formula here, you can just simply rewrite it as uh, the stopping potential V0 is equal to H over E times the frequency minus phi over E. So you can just do a very simple linear fit, and that's the kind of thing that has been done in the past. And remarkably then from that, just by shining light of different frequencies and doing this simple linear fit, then you're able to do a kind of Y equals MX plus C line fit where the gradient of the line, if you're plotting voltage V0 here, then V0 is equal to H over E. H over E would be the gradient of the line times the independent variable, which is the frequency of the light F minus phi over E, which would be the intercept. So therefore, you can plot multiple points from multiple measurements and actually end up with an ability to measure Planck's constant because the gradient of this line would simply be H over E. Very easy then to find H if we know that the, that the charge of an electron is 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. And likewise for the material, the work function phi uh, can also be found by phi over E being matched by the intercept of that fitted line with that y-axis, which is the stopping potential V0.